Ok, velkommen til en veldig spennende episode av Skrevleklassen Special. Så heldig dag å ha med to mennesker jeg beundrer veldig mye. En av de beundrer tredje mann ekstremt mye, og det skal bli veldig spennende. Jeg har med mig Hilde Østby, forfatter, tenker, agent, provokatør, ny venn. Du kan jo introdusere deg selv litt også, men først og fremst har vi jo med fra La Jolla, i Kalifornien, Dr. Vincent Folletti. Welcome, Vincent. Yes. <laughs> How are you? Do you do you remember me that we met? I I remember that we met, but I don't remember the details. <laughs> no, I was living in LA with my best friend. He's still living there in Glendale, and I got your contact info from Johan Hari, and I. Uh-huh. Came to your beautiful estate at La Jolla. You still live there? Yes. Yes. And I greatly enjoyed the view of the ocean, looking out at China every morning. <laughs> That's great. So I'm just going to be very effective here and uh, introduce you to each other because Hilde Östby, East B, uh, <laughs> Hilde Östby. It's a great admirer of yours, and uh, she's very happy to be able to talk to you. Uh, we also have a third woman uh, who is not here today, but who is also a, a very big um, fan of yours. But we have her questions. Uh, so you can maybe say two words about her also when it suits you, Hilda. So let's just kick it off. I'm going to be more, more or less a moderator, and if I have anything... Uh, special I want to ask about. I'm going to step in, but Hilda, the floor is yours. What do you want to ask Mr. Felitti? Yeah, I'm so happy to meet you, Dr. Felitti. I've been... Uh, it's 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 <laughs> okay, <laughs> I will be informal then. Uh, I've been uh, around at schools teaching your research to school children and also been writing a lot about... Uh, about your research and reading your research with great interest. Um, it's a big part of my last book and uh, also, of course, in the next book, right? Which is... You're working with me, you and I. Yeah. You can bring the filter there's in a storm. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, now the connection just... I don't know which connection was bad, but everything froze now. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about everybody else in the room here. Uh, well, well uh, excuse me one second, uh, people. Uh, can we just track back and we edit it because something happened with the connection? So I'm going to go again. I'm very sorry. Yeah, yeah. Hilda Spee, the floor is yours. What do you want to yeah. ask Dr. Filetti? Yeah. Um, what is that noise? Do you, anybody know? Sorry, I uh, have to... Um, Hilde vet hva den lyden er, vi klipper hvor dette kommer sånne piper. It's gonna go now. I'm gonna turn. Er det en mobil eller noe sånt? Ja, it's my phone kind of ringing. Sorry Vincent, it's just some technical issues. We're still pretty primitive here in Norway. Okay, I start, we're gonna make a hard cut. We're gonna yep. edit it. Okay. Sorry about the connection and the sound. Var det en ny lyd for deg, Hilde? Uh, I have a problem since uh, my uh, since I'm online. All the things that is online will come into uh, my computer as sounds, uh, and I cannot turn off the sound because then I cannot hear you. Yeah, that's so, strange. Okay, we for just hope that it doesn't come so many things. So I'm gonna make a hard cut again here. Oh, sorry, Hilda, the floor is yours. What do you want to yeah. ask, Doctor Vincent? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I have been teaching your research to youth in schools uh, for the last couple of months. And it's also part of my last book, which is about uh, my body. <laughs> and uh, my next book, which is about loneliness. Um, so <laughs> the loneliness book uh, ro- uh, was creating a lot of questions in me because I already read, uh, read your research 
and uh, it suddenly dawned on me. Right, I'm gonna tell you my uh, how I got into this um, uh, insight or epiphany. It was an epiphany when I read uh, John Cacioppo's research research on loneliness, and uh, his research is clearly stating that uh, you know uh, loneliness over time will create. Um, heart disease, autoimmune disease, obesity, sleep deprivation, you know, uh, actually the same things that your uh, research on ACE uh, shows, clearly. Um, much, of the, much of the research, at least in English, um, refers to the phrase toxic stress yeah, exactly. as being the causal issue by hyperstimulating certain areas of the brain decades after the fact, causing on the one hand, immune system suppression, and on the other hand, the release of pro-inflammatory chemicals. Mm -hmm. So when you get to things like cancer, I mean, how the hell does something that happens as a kid cause cancer 50 years later? Well, that's easy, it's by immune system suppression. And the piece that most people will have heard about is that if you get an organ transplant, you need to be on lifetime immunosuppression so you don't reject the organ. And one of the side effects of that lifetime immunosuppression is an increased risk of cancer. Well, you know, if, if I'm going to die without the kidney next week, I'll take my chance on cancer in 20 years. And the way that happens is that all of us are forming cancer cells every day, several hundred of them from a variety of different organs. Our immune system has recognized them, they destroy them, and we never know that that process is going on. But if you have immune system suppression, whether it be from pharmaceutical agents or from toxic stress, then some of those cells will go on to become clinically obvious. Mm -hmm. uh, that's great. Uh, and we're going to delve into this. I just, for the listener's sake, I just have to clarify a few terms, especially one. You talk about the ACE studies. I just have to inform the listeners yeah. that ACE stands for adverse childhood experiences study, which you conducted in late 70s, early 80s? Well, we, we conducted it over a period of 20 years. We started in the late 90s. Sorry. The initial observations were in an obesity program that I was running here. We were using the then new technology of supplemented absolute fasting, where people ate no food whatsoever for up to one year. Now, if that's all you do, just drink water, you'll die in about six weeks because of major potassium and magnesium deficiencies setting off lethal cardiac rhythm disturbances. All right, that's easy. You mix potassium, magnesium in your glass of water. Tastes lousy, but it works. If you have the weight to carry you forward, then people will next start dying in about six months of amino acid deficiency. Okay, a little more complicated. You got to mix a half a dozen amino acids into your glass of water so you can continue to make protein. If you have the weight to carry you forward, people will next die in about one year of vitamin deficiencies that most people have never heard of because they've not been you know, seen for the past three quarters of a century, pellagra, berry, berry, scurvy, et cetera. Mm. Okay, 10 cents worth of multivitamins mixed in. And the product was called OptiFast, O-P-T-I, fast, F-A-S-T, as an optimal fast. It was made by Sandoz Pharmaceuticals originally, and they ultimately sold it to Nestle's, a European country, I believe. Anyway, that enabled us safely and reliably to take people's weight down about 300 pounds in one year. And we, of course, were the wow, I mean, got this problem licked. Little did we know. We had an enormously high dropout rate from the program, not because people were missing food, but because the major weight loss was threatening to them. And as we pursued this, we discovered Childhood sexual abuse and obesity, and obesity is extraordinarily common. Mm. And so what would happen would be that girls would eat to reduce their anxiety, you know, 
an English expression, sit down and have something to eat, you'll feel better. And then as they put on weight, they discovered that putting on substantial amounts of weight reduced the sexual attention. Mm. So, you know, gain 100 pounds, you've desexualized yourself, not as well as with 200 pounds, but nevertheless, the story is obvious. Mm. For men, it was to provide the illusion of, politi- of, of, uh, of power. Mm. In English, there's the expression throwing your weight around. And what we we learned that issue by having two men in the program who were guards at the state penitentiary downtown. One lost 100 pounds, one lost 150 pounds. Each of them made it very clear they were no longer comfortable to walking into the prisoner cell blocks normal weight. They felt a hell of a lot better going in looking as big as a refrigerator. You know, again, the illusion of power associated with size. So that was really interesting. And as we went down that path, then we discovered that, you know, there were all sorts of other unspoken adverse experiences. You know, father abandoned the family when I was five. Mother committed suicide when I was three. My brother was put in prison as a teenager, um, et cetera. And so, and so we, we simply picked the 10 most common of those, not the only 10 in the world, and they might be different, you know, in, in different countries to some degree. I mean, if you come from some war-torn part of the world, there might be some different aces in there. So I presented that at the National Obesity Meeting in 1990 in Atlanta, Georgia, I was attacked by the audience. Some guy gets up and says, you really need to understand, Dr. Felitti, that these statements by patients are fabrications designed to provide a cover explanation for failed lives. And I thought, oh, Jesus, you know. <laughs> you, mean, you mean people are making false claims of incest for social aggrandizement? Yeah, right. Uh, but this, this is so uh, funny that you tell me this because this is my experience too. When I go around in schools, people get angry at me. Just sure. on Friday, I had a lecture on your research on on kind of this um, this notion that the body is just you know in Rene Descartes' view, just this mechanical thing that we can manipulate as we wish by reason, and uh, when we don't do that. We are stupid or lazy. That is kind of the view of obesity in this world. And still, and people get really angry when I talk about trauma. They don't want to hear this. Uh, and why is it? Why is it that people don't want to hear this? Well, because we have all been very taught. We have all been taught very effectively as children that nice people don't talk about certain things. Yeah. Okay, I mean, you don't go out on a date and ask your girlfriend if she's ever been raped. Okay, yeah. that that kind of thing. And many patients would tell me that they tried to tell their mother what was happening. Their uncle was molesting them. Their grandfather was molest, and their mother would tell, them, "Oh, you're misunderstanding. He would never do anything like that. Don't say things like that. That's terrible." Yeah. So that kind of locked them down into secrecy. <laughs> now, something you might keep in mind to reduce community uh, hostility. If you could get a local newspaper publisher to publish the ACE questionnaire, the one page version, 10 question version in the newspaper, asking readers to respond anonymously, then pooling the data, publishing the pool data. We did that with several cities in this country. It was enormously popular with the publishers because their advertising rates are based on readership. And believe me, this really exploded readership. Have you seen what's in the paper today? My God, you won't believe it. You better get a copy and read it, et cetera. So keep keep that in mind as a you know an alternate to doing it with kids in, in class. Yeah. I want to ask you one thing I forgot last time we spoke because you said you were presenting this uh, evidence on a meeting in the 90s and you almost got booed off stage. Is that correct? Yeah, so so okay, well, yeah, yeah. So at, at that dinner meeting in 1990, that meeting where I was attacked, there was a dinner for speakers afterwards and some guy from the CDC. Are you familiar with the CDC? 
Yes, uh, after so Corona, I've been uh, quite familiar with it. A, a really major government agency relating to disease control. It's Dr. Fauci, right? Yeah. I'm sorry? It's Dr. Fauci. He's the leader. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so uh, seated next to me was somebody from the CDC, and he said, look, you know, if what you're saying is true, it's got enormous importance for the country as well as the practice of medicine, but nobody's going to believe your 286 cases. We need a large epidemiologically sound study with thousands of people and from a general population, not some obese group that you've collected somehow. Mm. Okay, no problem, because in my in my department, one of the other divisions was called health appraisal, and we provided unusually comprehensive medical evaluation to over 58,000 people a year in one setting. It was the largest operation of its type single site in the Western world. So how many are we talking about? We said, yeah, 26,000. Yeah, we can handle that. No problem. No problem. <laughs> no, so we we then submitted the we we spent two years working on the proposal, submitted it to the IRB. All medical research in this country since World War II and the Nuremberg trials has had to go through an institutional review board, basically to be sure that nobody's going to try to reintroduce Nazi me medical experiments here. Yeah. So they turned it down flat. Otherwise, sensible people said, you can't use that questionnaire. Those questions are going to cause patients to decompensate, maybe occasionally become suicidal. It took us eight months of battling with, this, with the IRB before we finally got agreement. Mm -hmm. So then we put the ACE study into play in 1997. OK, we did it in two phases. We asked 13,000 people coming through if they would help us and then waited six months to see if we needed to change anything or add anything and then add ask the next 16,000. So we asked 26,000 patients coming through for unusually comprehensive medical evaluation if they would help us understand how what happens as a child might affect your health as an adult. 17 and a half thousand agreed to participate. So we started with very extensive, you know, medical evaluation, including very detailed history, including the developmental years, which ordinarily is never part of an adult medical history. And then we followed those people for the next 20 years. Kaiser Permanente, a, a huge medical care organization here, we, we have um, approximately, um, I think it's now 12 million members in the United States mostly on the West Coast. We have about 10 million, mem uh, 9 million members in California, for instance. Um, and um, the population is very stable. So, you know, those people were basically there for the next for the next 20 years. And so all of the publications from the A study came out of that. If you look up adverse childhood experiences on the Internet, you will be blown away. I mean, there'll be like a hundred pages of citations that'll suddenly be on your screen. And if you have any special question, like how does adverse childhood experiences relate to suicide? Type in adverse childhood experiences hyphen suicide, and you know you'll have a hundred articles from around the world uh, relating to that. That's amazing. That, but the reason I asked you, Vincent, uh, sorry, Hilda, two seconds. Uh, the reason I asked you about you getting booed on stage in 1997 is, I don't know if you're aware of this, but a hundred years before 1997, in 1897, uh, a doctor named Sigmund Freud studied in Paris. Have you heard that story? Oh, of course. Uh, yeah. Just to clarify for the listeners, he studied in Paris. He got involved in a debate about child molesting in the French community, and he saw a link between uh, trauma and different kinds of uh, illnesses in adulthood. And he tried to uh, present this paper, it's, it's called the uh, Etology of Hysteria. And he also was booed off stage exactly 100 years before you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm, what, I'm well, what the hell is going on there? Why, why is this? Is it like a Dan Brown novel? Is it forbidden knowledge? Is it well? Well, rather than, rather than one remarkable person talking about small numbers of patients, 
we had a huge number of patients that were studied in standardized detail over a 20 year period. So we had a radically different, you know, database supporting what we were saying. Hmm. Of course. And I'm not very surprised that Freud was booed off stage, but you booed off stage 100 years later with the same evidence and huge amounts of data. Sounds like someone's want to stop this information coming through. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. But, well, absolutely. That's why I say if you can generate widespread community interest through a newspaper publication of the questionnaire, you know, requesting for anonymous answers, et cetera, and then publishing those pooled answers, you'll you'll do something to weaken resistance. But uh, so what do you, I, I have so many questions. Uh, yeah. The thing is, uh, yeah, okay, I'll tell you everything I found out, <laughs> Vincent, and then you can evaluate. But um, when I read the uh, research on loneliness, I it kind of grew very obvious to me that what they were describing like, as toxic stress um, was the was the stress after experiencing adverse childhood experiences. And how I could know this is because I am a five A's person myself. So I know for sure uh, that the one feeling I had as a child was loneliness. That was the loneliest experience I had in my life. And then I talked to all these trauma experts and they said, yes, of course, uh, loneliness is a big part of trauma. But we haven't researched it yet. And suddenly it, uh, it dawned on me that these two fields are not talking together at all. <laughs> that what you found out hasn't been communicating with uh, the research of um, Dr. John Cioppo, the, the kind of main figure in loneliness research. He, he's describing in kind of a great variety what loneliness will do to your body, uh, uh, among other things it will be a driving force in overeating and, uh, you know, drugs, drug abuse. So um, everything he's describing is kind of just the effect of long time uh, traumatic stress to me. It's well, a good thing to keep in mind when you're explaining this to people is so-called crystal meth. I don't know if that term exists in Norway. It does. Okay, so most common street drug in this country. You know, bad stuff, people die from it, terrible. Virtually no one knows that crystal meth is the street name for methamphetamine, which was the first successful prescription antidepressant introduced for sale in the United States in the early 1940s. Does that mean anything? Yeah, well, one thing it means is that you don't need to say my kid's buying antidepressants on the street, which might lead your friends to say, really? Why? Not a comfortable question to face. You say, my kid's buying that goddamn crystal meth on the street because there's a dealer on the block, which, you know, essentially negates any meaningful understanding of it. Yeah, but also kind of what uh, struck me was I also... Okay, a lot of, I got a lot of questions now, but also from Trine Tetley Eichnes, which is uh, she's researching ob obesity and treating obesity in Norway, and she's using your research. Uh, she's uh, completely uh, kind of tuned in on your research, and she's asking why it is such a hard time for uh, the modern medical science to incorporate. Trauma is this kind of part of the very hard division between uh, psychology and medicine, or, or what is what is it that makes? Well, so, so in our obesity program, we didn't teach the patients anything. Mm. We had them meet in groups. We, we did not see them individually. They, they became a member of a stable group of about 10 or 12 patients. And that group would meet together once every week for two hours for 26 weeks minimum. And we would ask questions to help them discover what they knew deep down mm -hmm. and bring it up into consciousness. Question, why do you think people become obese? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and then, you know, we would get answers between them and write them down on the blackboard. What are the benefits of obesity? Not the risks. You can get the risk from a government pamphlet. What are the benefits of obesity? And the answers, I have a lot of video recordings of them, were extraordinary. People will leave you alone. Yeah. Men won't bother you. Okay? People will expect less of you, mm. etc. Oh, wow. I mean, so there are benefits. And, you know, if you're using obesity to desexualize yourself or to provide the illusions of great physical power, well, then losing the basis for that illusion is, oh, wow. Mm. So that's why people were fleeing. The people dropping out of the weight program were the ones who were successfully losing weight. Mm. You know, somebody had 250 pounds to lose, they'd lose 75 pounds and they'd flee. So ultimately, we figured out how to keep them in the program, you know, until until the end. And the groups doing this with groups rather than individuals was very important because what we discovered was that the individuals had very poor support systems at home. Yeah. And the group became their support system. They were able to speak openly about the unspeakable and do it with a supportive group. So uh, community. Yeah. yeah. Community is healing for yeah. sure. Yeah. But why do you think that medicine and psychology isn't talking at all together? Is Say it that, again. Why? why The thing is, uh, I've been studying uh, history of ideas and reading Descartes for uh, years and years, and suddenly I realized the impact of uh, Descartes. And Descartes was making a clear uh, split between the soul and the body. And to me, it seems like medicine and psychology isn't talking at all together. Well, it's, a, it's a lot easier to practice medicine if you believe that everything is a purely biomedical problem. Yeah. Okay. And my colleagues would say to me, you know, if I wanted to be a damn psychiatrist, I'd have been a psychiatrist. I'm a, you know, cardiologist or gynecologist or what have you. Or, you know, what the hell am I supposed to do with that information? That was 50 years ago, for God's sake. And and what we found was, you know, so successful was saying to a patient in the exam room, I see on the questionnaire that. Can you tell me how that's affected you later in your life? Mm. And we listened, period. No humbug about, oh, that must have been awful. I'm so sorry. No, we listened, period. Mm. We did one other thing. We implicitly accepted them. Yeah. Okay. And that was very odd because I, I don't know if I if I told you 10 minutes ago, but I used to be stopped two, three times a day, every day over a couple of years by patients going home after the comprehensive medical evaluation visit who wanted to thank me for putting those questions on the questionnaire mm -hmm. and then often went on to tell me how grateful they were to the examiner who hearing the dark secrets of their life was still nice to me and they want to see me again. Yeah. So, wow. I mean, you know, what must this person have been living with? Uh, you, you talk about obesity and that's the main uh, issue of your of your uh, research but uh, it's also important that for the listeners especially to emphasize that this is not only obesity but drug addiction oh absolutely depression can you say just shortly which, which kinds of difficult life situations adults well okay so which so have been uh, uh, traumatized uh, let's bit? say cancer when we when we discovered the huge dose response relationship between a score and cancer later in life our first thought was yeah well you, you know you smoke three packs a day to feel better of course and that's true but that was just a little piece of the answer the big piece of the answer was due to the far more subtle issue that is you know known but not widely recognized the relationship of malignancy to immune system suppression mm. Now, there's a book that you should look up on Amazon. You can sample it. It's called Judging Me. It is the most extraordinarily open autobiography that I've ever seen. 
The author is a United States federal judge. That's a very big office in this country. Her name is Mary Elizabeth Bullock, B-U-L-L-O-C-K. You can look it up on Amazon, as I say. Mary Elizabeth, who lives in town, and I've gotten to know her fairly well, Mary Elizabeth was the incest victim of her father for over a decade. Worse yet, as a young teenager, he would bring her into saloons at night and sell her to strangers for sex. So she describes all of this in you know, remarkable detail in the book. Mary Elizabeth somehow did not commit suicide, did not become a mass murderer. She graduated high school. Scholarship to college, graduated. Scholarship to law school, graduated. Became a law school professor, then a United States federal judge. Wow. I mean, it's so wonderful how that little girl with that hideous history was so resilient. That illustrates the weakness of the way we conceptualize resilience, which we base on social success, academic success, occupational success, and economic success. We don't look at biomedical outcomes. And one of the major researchers in the field of resilience, a woman named Emmy Werner, makes this point on page 67 of her book, that when you're assessing re uh, uh, resiliency, it's very important to look at biomedical outcomes. Mary Elizabeth Bullock has had five different kinds of cancer not relapses, but five different kinds of cancer, and also three autoimmune diseases, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and multiple sclerosis. And we found clear, we studied, we studied 21 different autoimmune diseases in our 17 and a half thousand patients. And we found a very clear dose response relationship of underlying A score to 16 of those 21 autoimmune diseases. So, I mean, this, this woman is, you know, how, how she's still alive and functioning, God only knows. But I mean, that's an interesting question in its own right. So, so keep, keep that in mind. So just to make sure the listeners are following this, people are subjected to trauma in their childhoods, whether it be sexual abuse, neglect, abandonment, violence, drugs, alcoholism. They're not only prone to being overweight, end up with drug, drug addiction, depression, suicidal thoughts. They're also prone to be cancer patients and getting out to mean diseases. This is extraordinary. Or, uh, or a heavy depression or... Sleep deprivation. So, so there are two broad pathways from life experiences to disease states. One is through the use of various coping mechanisms, mm. eating, drinking, drug use, etc. Okay, and you know the, the short-term benefits and the long-term risks. Okay, so so and and the other is more more subtle, and that's the effect of toxic stress on the brain decades after the fact, hyperstimulating certain areas of the brain or suppressing certain areas of the brain and the consequences of that. So when you get to 16 different autoimmune diseases, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, scleroderma, stuff like that. You know, then you're talking about immune system suppression or distortion. So your immune system is now attacking parts of your own body. And and the other the other pathway is the 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 side of the immediate sorry the long term side effects of various coping mechanisms that have short term benefits but long term risks. Yeah, but mostly it will be a mix of mixture, I would guess. Perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. Ab absolutely. And all of this is overwhelmingly unrecognized. Overwhelmingly. Yeah, it's, good it's part because we've all been taught as children, nice people don't talk about certain things. You know, so you go through life, well, you can't ask patients questions like that. I mean, they'll be furious and no one will tell you the truth anyway. Well, that is totally incorrect. We have done this now with 1.1 million adults over a 30-year period going through my department. No patient complaints, lots of colleague complaints, 
you know, what the hell am I supposed to do with that? And that you know, if I wanted to be a goddamn psychiatrist, I'd have been a psychiatrist, that kind of thing. But no patient complaints. In fact, I have a number of letters of thanks um, from, from patients. Really, really quite interesting. Actually, I'll send you one of them. It's called Dear Doctor. Yeah, perfect. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll send you the, the integrated questionnaire that we used, the medical yes. history questionnaire where the ACE questions were integrated uh, so that they were mixed in with lots of biomedical questions. And I send you also an anonymized actual patient response to okay. see what we knew about this person before we even met them. I mean, it was you know kind of mind boggling what we knew. Um, we knew where we had to go further and where we didn't need to go further. But, but there's another American expression or very American-ish expression because you talk about uh, don't ask those questions, but the, the expression, uh, every man makes his own luck. Uh, that is also uh, something that is imprinted in the American spirit and the Western civilization, especially in like with the Reagan era. And he's saying things like we have to reject the... The notion that uh, the the the, um, uh, uh, the offender is the victim and stuff like that. Everyone can pull yourselves off the bootstraps. It's an ideological issue. It's it's we want to think that everyone is. It's an egg in lucky smell. When I see one it's killer. Yeah, no master of their own destiny. Yeah, master of their own destiny. That's so very imprinted in uh, the Western culture, and especially American. Uh, but, but but your research is kind of contracting that a bit. Yeah, to, to follow up, Vincent, I have to ask you, since, I'm, since I myself is a five ace person, so uh, that means that I am battling a lot of childhood trauma all the time, really. Uh, and does this mean, does, your research is very good, and I'm very happy that you're talking about these things, because... As you say, people with trauma will happily talk about them. I'm more than happy if people ask me about them because I've been living with secrets my whole life. It's such a relief to finally be understood. But what I'm going to ask you is, is this, am I doomed? <laughs> am I doomed to become a cancer patient or, you know? Two, two, two things to keep in mind. I mean, basically, no one knows the answer to that question yet. Okay, that's going to take, again, years of study and thousands of people that are followed reliably. But two things to keep in mind. I'm, I'm a very big believer in psychotherapy, but the problem is that psychotherapy is an inefficient process, hence expensive, hence unaffordable to many people. Some years ago, I met a psychologist in town who was a very effective hypnotherapist. And over the years, I probably referred him to or 300 patients. And I have been repeatedly impressed how much he's able to accomplish in terms of symptom relief in two or three visits, which pretty much anybody can afford. Mm -hmm. okay, so that's worth keeping in mind if you can find a hypnotherapist who is, you know, medically oriented, not doing magic stuff on a stage. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is the benefits of autobiographical writing. There's a man named James Pennebaker at the University of Texas, P-E-N-N-E -E Baker, who wrote a book on autobiographical writing and its benefits in medical practice. Yeah. And, and since the late 80s, I've been recommending to patients, you know, that they write me an autobiography in five-year segments and, you know, do it on your computer with, with password protection so that you're guaranteed privacy, et cetera. That's really very, very helpful in helping people self-discover relationships that, you know, may have been unconsciously suppressed before. I'm, so, I'm a writer, so I'm just publishing it. <laughs> huh? I'm a writer, so I'm just publishing it. <laughs> okay. But yeah, well, there, there are a number of really important books that have been written about high A score and effect and so forth. And the reason they're so important is because they illustrate to the general public that it's possible to speak about this. Yeah, I but, think. Uh, no, sorry, Hilda. 
No, and also it's this, uh, I, I wrote about that in my uh, previous book uh, on creativity, how uh, how just reading books, how reading about other experiences is uh, part of a biblio, bibliotherapy program, which is uh, kind of being researched in, in Britain, as I know, and in Norway as well, how how it works just to talk about experiences through books, <laughs> actually. Yeah. No, so do, you, do you all know a woman in Norway named um, um, Anna Louise Kirkingen? No. No, you asked me last time. No, yeah, yeah, of course. Yes, of course, no. Kirkingen, yes. Okay, yeah, she, she is in Oslo and, uh, you know, she's, uh, she's really... Wonderful. Yeah, I read it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and what do you think about her discovering a lot of the same things that you as you were discovering at the same time, kind of parallel? What do you think about that? What? Why did that happen at that time? Do you think? I, I I truly am not sure. I mean, you know, given the fact there's several billion people in the world, it may have been just a coincidence. I mean, I met her because I I. I'm one of the editors of a medical journal here, and I was also a book review editor. I somehow stumbled across her book and, you know, wrote a review of it, sent her a copy of the review, and we became friends, and we've cross-visited. She's come to the United States to visit with me. I've gone to Norway to visit with her and so on. And this was a very popular subject with the Queen of Sweden, if that's of any use to you. <laughs> Because, uh, I don't know, maybe six years ago, uh, the Queen of Sweden got wind of the ACE study and uh, she uh, invited me to speak in, um, in, in Sweden. And oh. uh, you know, who is sitting in the center of row one in the audience but the Queen of Sweden with two, two burly bodyguards on, on each side. Yeah, a really interesting woman. Yeah, we were talking maybe for a half hour afterwards, and I was just so impressed. She was just such a straightforward, plain, sensible person. I remember when she left, the thought crossed my mind. You know, I'll bet she even knows how to cook. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, I don't think I'd have come to that conclusion if I had been talking to Queen Elizabeth let us. <laughs> Did you mention that you actually look a bit like her husband? Or he maybe don't agree? Oh, no, no. no the King was, of Sweden and you, they're, you're kind of... Uh, oh, really? That was very interesting. Huh. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you, um, uh, uh, do you think like uh, cliches like Alice Miller's book uh, where... Most people haven't read it, but like the takeaway is like if Hitler had gone to art school, he wouldn't start the war and stuff like that. Do you think cliches like that may have been uh, damaging to this uh, these ideas? If you understand my question, I understand the question. I I I I, I simply don't have an answer at the moment. Um, I I don't know. Like. If, I it's been it's some years. Explanation I, for evil, like no. Stalin uh, was uh, treated uh, badly when he when was a choir boy, and like to 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 excuse evil persons uh, or some cliches to uh, explain why they became evil, and this maybe has been damaging to to very important ideas about <laughs> overwhelmingly normal people with the uh, uh, troubles in their lives, like those evil. Uh, powerful people are very, very few. It's not so interesting. Yeah, but no. they, they kill no, the it's, people. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a certainly a valid question. You know, how, how do you make Adolf Hitler? Um, so, yeah. Um, I think... Yeah, well, it, actually, on the opening slide of most of my presentations... I have a photograph of a newborn infant on the left and on the right a photograph of a man lying unconscious on the sidewalk in downtown San Diego under, underneath a huge mural painting of a face looking straight out, okay? 
you know, so it, it sort of typifies we overlook such things as, you know, somebody lying unconscious on the sidewalk. And I, I posed to the audience the question, if somebody gave you this newborn infant with its extraordinary potential, what would you have to do over the next 18 or 20 years to create this person lying unconscious on the sidewalk overlooked by the world? I think uh, one of the most difficult things is to read about how um, how complex this is. The the notion of a person being subject to abuse and then kind of uh, being this overlooked uh, person that we look down on, and also a lot of the people being traumatized will also give their trauma to their children again. And this kind of mix-up of the bad guy and the good guy is so difficult for us. That is just my re- kind of what I'm thinking. That we we're, we're not able to even see that. It's just it just goes against everything in Hollywood, which is kind of black and white. The bad guy, the good guy. We cannot see them as one person. But uh, well, in this country, there there have been a number of ACE studies carried out in the prison system, and and uh, that's been overwhelmingly high ACE scores. So, but keep in mind the idea of getting published the ACE questionnaire, you know, uh, in a student newspaper, maybe at the university, yeah, yeah. in yeah. a city newspaper, uh, with a group of kids in a school. Um, you know, I don't know what you call a so-called reform school in Norway, but, you know, sort of yeah. prison for children, you know, do it with kids there, etc. But uh, uh, I have some questions from Tina. This, uh, she's uh, working in obesity. And she says that uh, her clinical experience says that women with obesity, with ACEs, spend their adult lives serving and attending others' needs, making lifestyle changes impossible. So have you seen some of this, this kind of serving um, behavior that you're going into this role of the servant kind of to others um, that is also kind of harmful? Yeah, the, the closest that I can come to, you know, that would be, it's obvious to me that in hospital systems, nurses and nurses' aides often are quite obese. Mm. And, you know, so using your question, could it be that they see the hospital as potentially a support system and, you know, go there? Well, cer- certainly possible. The, the issue exists in the army. When I was an army doctor years ago, uh, every doctor in this country in those days had to, you know, go into the military for two years of service. I was really impressed that the army had many characteristics of a supportive family. Years later, I'm on a government committee that was put together to study why there was such a high rate of suicide in army recruits, not people coming back from Afghanistan, but people just duly going into the army. Mm -hmm. That came to my mind. I wrote to the then Surgeon General, uh, to the then uh, 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 the the Chief of Staff of the United States Army, uh, General Shinseki, uh, with this idea. He passed it on to the psychiatrist who was the head psychiatrist for the army. And he decided that he would use the ACE questionnaire at a huge infantry training center, Fort Hood in Texas. So they put that into play. And we were very pleased. We thought, well, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna learn stuff here. Within, within two months, he had to shut it down because the drill instructors, who in this country are sort of caricature, really tough guys, <laughs> the drill instructors could not emotionally handle the number of recruits who were breaking down, crying, filling out the ACE questionnaire. Oh. So, wow, what an interesting insight. Maybe my idea 
was correct that people with need for support systems see the army as a support system. Yeah, you know, might put my life at risk, but I'll have a support system, etc. Unfortunately, uh, the the psychiatrist who put it into into play, uh, his wife shortly developed cerebral metastases, and he was up for retirement soon. So it was never really worked out. Several years later, I'm on another government committee and some senior people from the Army Surgeon General's office were there. I bring this up to them. And this this one um, colonel looks at me and he says, you mean you expect us to acknowledge that the United States Army is made up of vulnerable people? (laughs) Okay. (laughs) That's the latest way of resisting dealing with this. (laughs) You're talking about. Uh, oh, pres- oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, I just have one thought. <laughs> because, you're, the, you're the star here. <laughs> no, uh, it's just that this supports kind of my thought on the um, connection between ACE, uh, I mean, adverse childhood experiences and loneliness, and how every in every instance, as I look, I can see how the people with a high ACE score will be even more eager to go into all kinds of community work that uh, you 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 can finally find your community a lot of people in the cultural sector that i met have a high a score and i really want to create community for others it's this strong drive in us yeah Yeah. more yeah but vincent you you mentioned prisons uh i i guess uh, i'm right in saying that uh, people with ACE, high ACE scores are overrepresented in prisons and long-term sentences, is that correct? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, are you familiar with the the, um, uh, the research uh, also here in Norway by a guy named Ragnar Kristoffersen who's researching recid- recidivism rates in prisons in the United States versus Norway? Uh, he says, for example, that open prisons where they treat uh, uh, murderers, rapists, and very uh, 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 serious criminals with more openness, more humanely, and give their uh, more autonomy and uh, treat them more as uh, humans. The recidivism rates drop uh, distinctively. In Norway, we actually have uh, the lowest recidivism rates in uh, the world, almost. Uh, it's almost as low as 20%, whereas in the United States, it's between 70 and 90 percent uh, depends on uh, how many years after they released they commit another crime do you think there is a link between recidivism and the recidivism debate here also she talked about yeah. uh, different fields uh, should talk together here's also another field that maybe should talk together if you're not already done it mm-hmm. yes, yes very very much so I'm, I'm not surprised by what you're telling me Fortunately, there is a beginning in this country, in California, I know, uh, of of putting advanced education systems into prisons. Like you can go to college in prison. Wow. Wow. I mean, whoever would have heard of such a thing? Um, So, you know, things are moving slowly in, in a meaningful direction there. It's maybe a tabloid question, but do you think, uh, simple uh, as the idea sounds, if we treat people that act terribly or to, towards themselves or others more humanely, we will have a more secure society? Well, it's a simple experiment. <laughs> yeah. And do you think you know, about take, take half of one prison of a prison and run it one way and the other half the other way? And what happens over time when you follow those people for five or ten years? Like a Stanford, uh, Stanford 2.0. And also on a global scale, I, I wonder, like, if you look at Africa with so many traumatized people from war. I talked to a woman just the other day on a podcast from East Africa. She was a fugitive from uh, the war between Ethiopia and Eritrea. It's one of the most cruel war, uh, civil wars ever. Africa is filled with people like this, not of their own fault, of course. Is there anything strange with uh, many African countries being so unstable when we think about how many people that are affected this war? I think that they were basically severely damaged by occupying European countries. So this know, is eight studies on a global scale. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Traumatized yeah. continent. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. 
Yeah. Yeah, and talking about that, I, I kind of stumbled across the research of Arlene Geronimus. Do you know her? I've heard her name, but I, I don't know her, no. Yeah, she's uh, studying uh, the effect of racism on the body. So she's calling it weathering. But to me, it also seems like she's just describing the A studies. Yeah. It was a huge study now. Just It was done... Uh, over a 20-year period on 400 Afro-Americans. Um, and they were following these people for 20 years from they were uh, age 7 to 27. And what they found was that um, the more racism they experienced in their early years, the more weathering kind of bodily erosion they would experience. And the bodily erosion is, as we know, the same thing you describe in your A study. So to me, it sounds like also that was describing the same kind of thing, the, the feeling of being uh, not welcome <laughs> in your society. Yeah. You, you're not wanted. You're not wanted yeah. here. Yeah. And that has a bodily consequence. <laughs> and you can turn it on the other way around also. Are you familiar with uh, Robert Sapolsky, the biologist, uh, Vincent? Again, I know his name. I don't, I don't know him. Yeah. yeah. He's yeah. also, I think, uh, maybe not aware of it, but a lot of what he's saying is reminiscent of what you're saying. He's uh, also talking about a lot of things, but he talks about Trump and Trumpism also maybe a by effect of a traumatized country, lonely people yeah. uh, that, as Hilda mentioned, people who are subjected to racism, they can have uh, consequences, but also people who are being racist or being Trumpist or whatever, yeah. Most likely are overrepresented in, in uh, on ACE um, metrics. Do you, don't yeah. do you agree in that assessment? Do you think that I, I, I believe that that's true? So it's a trauma, that, and you also maybe familiar with Angus Deaton and the book uh, Deaths of Despair, The Economist. <sighs> did did we talk earlier? You know, half hour ago um, about the effect of routinely integrating the ACE questions into medical practice? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We did, okay. Because I was talking with someone earlier in the day about that, and I got... Um, <laughs> I was just wondering, because Angus Deaton is talking about uh, the, the, the life expectancy going down in the United States last five or ten years because of overdose, uh, suicide. Uh, is America becoming a more and more traumatized society on a whole... I, I can't objectively answer that. Um, I mean, you know, I, I certainly see lots of problems going on, but I, I can't give you, a, you know, an objectively meaningful answer, you know, comparing it now to 1960s or 1940s or what have you. I, yeah. I, you know, it's certainly a very meaningful question. But life expectancy uh, is going down for the first time since uh, the 50s. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I'm, remarkable. Yeah, so you know, it certainly raises the question. No, no, no doubt about that. Um, but, but Vincent, I have to tell you, when I first read your research, I became very angry <laughs> because I felt like we are talking about the wrong things at all times. We're talking about broccoli. You have to eat broccoli. You have to smoke less. You yeah. Have to Oh yeah. Talk oh about yeah. The effects of something, and we yeah. don't talk about the issue itself. So, what did you think when you discover this first? Was well, it kind of anger? <laughs> no, I was. I was uncertain about its validity. I kept thinking. I mean, you know, this the sexual abuse issue. I mean, is so extraordinarily common. You know, am I doing something wrong somehow? You know, surely if this were true, people would know something if this outrageous were true. You know, somebody would have told me in medical school what that, what that was for. No, not a chance in hell. And it was only after, you know, literally pursuing in detail a number of cases, talking with patients, relatives, in one case, uh, a woman who had grown up in an obscure little town in Mississippi, I called up the sheriff in that town 
and said, this woman's my patient. She grew up in your town and she's telling me this. And so it was a little town where, you know, the sheriff would, the police department would know most of the people in it. And, and, the, and the sheriff says to me, oh yeah, doc, what's she, what she saying? Well, that happened. I said, yeah. Oh, wow. So, um, you know, I, I, did, I did spend a number of months checking the validity of this and, um, you know, it, um, there's no question it's real, but people don't want to know. The two biggest advances I can think of socially, one, would be to figure out how to improve parenting skills across the nation. Mm-hmm. And two would be to take an integrated medical questionnaire. I mean, one, you know, take maybe 45 minutes to fill out, put it on the internet free. Yeah. That anyone who wished could fill it out at home. And built into that would be a system that picked up all of the yes answers and organized them by body systems. You know, all the pulmonary answers together, the gastrointestinal answers together. That anyone who wished could fill that out and print it and add their name after they disconnected for safety and then give it to their doctor. Hmm. And what I see is using patients that way as a market force to bring about a needed change in medical practice. Hmm. You know, without question, the majority of physicians getting this information would hate it, resent it, et cetera. The question is, would a meaningful minority begin to see the reality of it and that expanding over time. Because, I mean, at Kaiser, you know, where in a 135,000 patient sample, I mean, there ain't many of them around, we found that integrating the ACE questions into the general medical history questionnaire led to a 35% reduction in outpatient visits the next year and an 11% reduction in emergency room visits. That has multi-billion dollar implications for the cost of medical care. Yeah, if, if only that. And also the, the reducing the suffering of people. <laughs> and because of that, now in the United States, 23 state legislatures, most recently California, have passed laws designed to support the collection of ACE information in medical practice. And I read just in the newspaper the other day that in California, there are now 500,000 adults. You know, there's 30 million adults in the state, but 500,000 adults who have had the ACE questionnaire applied to them in medical settings. So, you know, it's progress. Do you have any indication uh, of how many people on a whole uh, has been subjected to adverse childhood experiences in America? Can you give well, I, I could only, you know, say what we used, what we found in the ACE study was 17 and a half thousand patients. And, and, you know, lest one try to dismiss that, well, well those were, you know, people that were broken, et cetera. No, 74% of that population had been to college. Everybody had high-end medical insurance. So this was clearly a middle-class population, you know, not something that you could just sort of dismiss as living on the other side of town or somewhere. Uh, and, you know, it was just remarkably common. So, how, so what was the estimate? How many percent of the people participating have been subjected to adverse childhood experience? Well, I, I can only remember offhand. I mean, you know, it's easy to find on the Internet. But I, I can only remember offhand in a 17,500 person sample, adult middle class sample, 74% have been to college, et cetera. Um, 28% of the women and 16% of the men acknowledged the history of childhood contact sexual abuse. Mm. Yeah. That's kind of mind boggling. Mm. It is. And if that is, if that is a representative, that is 300 million Americans. Let's let's a conservative number. It's it's twenty thirty million people. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sure. Yeah. No. No more than that. I mean, twenty eight percent of yeah, it's a conservative estimate. People would be, you know, seventy five million or something like that. But, Ninety but million. You know, four can, four. 
But Vincent, why are we still, I cannot believe this, just every day in the newspapers, it's full of kind of dieting articles and it's medical doctors giving these dieting tips <laughs> to people. So it just blows my mind that we still are talking. Well, about I think it. that the two things are, one, we have all been very effectively taught as children that nice people don't talk about certain things. You know, these are unspeakable issues, etc. And two, if you're faced with the information, I, I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. You know, because I have no experience talking about that, etc. It's better to talk about food then. Huh? It's better to talk about food. It feels more safe to talk about food then. Sure. You know, and and but what we did in the obesity program was we asked people questions. Why do you think people get fat? And a, 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 a better question to start with is how old were you when you first began putting on weight? You know, seven, 28, 41. Why do you think it was then? Why not three years earlier or five years later? What was going on that it happened then? Hmm. Etc. So that, that's a good starting question. Um, it, it's how, how too old? scary then. It's too scary for most doctors, I guess, to, to talk. Yeah, about that. partly, uh, partly, no question. They don't know what to do with the information. It's mm -hmm. embarrassing. But why weren't you scared of the answers? Well, I'm not sure, but I do remember, and this repeatedly comes back to mind, in third grade, I always had my hand up, you know, asking questions. And the teacher once insulted me in front of the whole class. She says, the trouble with you, Vincent, is you ask too many questions. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's, that's, you know, what success I have had in medicine has been solely the result of asking too many questions. <laughs> you know, creating a 10-page medical history questionnaire that people had to fill out at home asking people unthinkable questions, um, you know, like, have you ever been molested as a child? Who in your family has committed suicide? Who in your household has been imprisoned, etc.? That That kind of thing is part of a routine medical history. What, what do you think about preventing generational trauma? And you said, you said we should... Kind of try well, I, to I think, the I think, parents. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think the issue there is how could you improve parenting skills mm. across an entire nation? Mm. And, and I remember when, I mean, here I was, an army doctor. I'd gone to a very prestigious medical school. My father was a pediatrician growing up and so forth. And the kids are born. And suddenly I realized I have no idea what to do. Yeah, you got to keep them warm and clean and fed. But, you know, what do you do more than that? I, I thought, Jesus, I mean, if this is me, you know, wow. Uh, <laughs> with the background I bring to this and I have no idea what the hell to do. Uh, so, for instance, uh, my son lives in France. He's a lawyer in uh, Strasbourg. And... Um, when his first child was born, I went to visit them. And right before I left, there was a television program here, a very famous uh, Boston pediatrician from Harvard uh, was talking about the importance of eye contact with infants. Mm. That had never crossed my mind. You know, I mean, sure, you look at them, but the eye contact with the <laughs> infant, you know, you gotta get them their bottle and feed them and keep them warm. And, stuff like that and hold them and you know but i can so i go there and here's my granddaughter she's like i don't know 10 days old or so and i do this eye contact thing i mean it was incredible the change i, I don't know how to describe it really adequately but the change in her and the change in me with this you know distinct wow Wow, I mean, this is this is really something of major significance. Yes, it is. Yeah, I, I'm writing about this in my loneliness book about the meaning of eye contact, and also this kind of how uh, stress reducing it is to be cuddled, because they researched it just now. This latest ten years, it's called C tactile Affer afferents. 
see tactile efference and uh, the meaning of just being cuddled like this. <laughs> Are, are, are your books being published in English or in, the, in Norwegian? No, in, in English? English as well. Yeah. So my creativity book is coming out, I think, next, next year. So what you might want to do is send a reviewer's copy to the Journal of the American Medical Association. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can look them up on the internet, their addresses in Chicago. Uh, you know, uh, book review editor, Journal of the American Medical Association, et cetera. Oh. Mail them a copy of that book. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and, and make the statement that given uh, the interest that the ACE study is attracting around the United States now, this might be a book um, worth reviewing in, in your journal. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. The last time uh, I, I I think I asked you, but I don't think we came to any conclusion because I was a bit more medicated then than I am now. But there's a doctor in uh, he's he died in Norway a couple of years ago. He's, he was a German cancer doctor, a, a very famous one in the 70s, and uh, he was very controversial in his later years because of his theories. And his story goes like this. Uh, his son was on vacation in France, in the Riviera. And uh, he his yacht was just next to the yacht of uh, a, an aristocratic Italian. Uh, you know, they, they have a parliamentary system, so it's they don't have a king or queen, but it's like a ancestor of the, the royal family. And he was in some trouble with the mafia or something. And by accident... Uh, they tried to kill this Italian prince, but the the, the recoil uh, hit uh, the cancer doctor's son and he was killed. And a couple of years later, he and his wife uh, got cancer. Uh, and he did like you did. He started asking, uh, making questionnaires, asking people uh, with cancer about tr traumatic experiences. And he was totally convinced that it's a link between trauma and cancer. He presented this evidence which was maybe not as thorough as yours, I don't know, but he was more or less exiled from Germany. Uh, uh, they used some of his uh, not so savory political statements against him and trying to link him with some right-wing extremists or something. And he, he fled to south of Norway and he died a couple of years ago, but he was, he was really, he died uh, in disgrace, he was he was a conspiracy theorist. He was a crazy Nazi, whatever. But his his theory was simple, and he discovered this because he and his uh, wife got cancer after the son was killed, and he questioned thousands of people with cancer. And uh, he, of his accord, it was astonishing how many people had uh, experienced trauma. Do you, you think there can be something in this theory? Because well, there's, there's no question about a relationship of A score, you know, to malignancy. And, and that's twofold. Part of it will be through various coping mechanisms, okay? I mean, nicotine for the psychoactive benefit, okay, you know, I need, I need something to help me now. I'll worry about, you know, cancer next week when things quiet down. That's one approach, and the other, the uh, one pathway, the other pathway is through the complex central nervous system effects on immune system suppression and release of pro inflammatory chemicals. I mean, for instance, the pro inflammatory chemical things uh, accounts for the relationship of stress to heart disease because toxic stress stimulates the release of pro-inflammatory chemicals, which cause inflammation in the lining of blood vessels. Mm. Once the lining of a blood vessel is inflamed, it has a magnetic effect on pulling cholesterol out of the blood as it flows by, even if the cholesterol level is quite low in the blood. For instance, statins, you know, the cholesterol-lowering drug statins have been long assumed to have their benefits by the fact that they lower the level of cholesterol, and, and they do, and that is beneficial. Maybe five years ago, it was discovered that the major effect of statins is not they're lowering the level of cholesterol. I mean, that's true, and it is beneficial. But the major effect of statins is an anti-inflammatory effect. Yeah. 
Wow. And that is so strong that people have even suggested the use of statins to treat influenza pneumonia, should there ever be a world pandemic of influenza okay. again. Because well, many countries will be too poor to be able to access adequate amounts of vaccine, et cetera, but statins are pretty cheap. And so, you know, that would be an affordable approach for many people. But again, this is kind of, it blows my mind that a lot of kind of nutritionalists are just picking up on this anti-inflammatory thing. And now they're kind of doing this. You have to eat this and that to get an anti-inflammatory effect on your body. And they're just cutting out all of your research, <laughs> all the research showing the body-soul connection that what you do to your soul, or kind of soul, I know it's it's lost for the medical science, but what you do to your psyche will uh, heavily affect your body much more than what you eat. Oh, I, I agree. You know, and, and that's that's a good part because of making meaningful changes in your diet is intellectually and emotionally very difficult. I mean, you know, so we're going to add more broccoli. Well, what if I were to add cauliflower instead? I mean, Jesus, where the hell are you going to find? You know, you're going to have to go on the Internet for a couple of hours to find the difference between the two, et cetera. Yeah, and that, that again, it's about talk. It's talking about the wrong stuff to me. It seems like. They're just cutting out all the important part of this research, which is the the inflammatory effect of trauma <laughs> on your body. So, so if if you can get information, well, see, like last year, the California legislature did two things to support the ACE study. They put up one hundred and thirty-five million dollars for two purposes, one to disseminate information about it to the general public and state, and the other to for medical care that any patient who gets seen by a physician as a Medi-Cal patient, Medi-Cal patient means you're poor, you can't afford it yourself, so the state pays for it. Any, any physician seeing a Medi-Cal patient who collects ACE information and puts it in the record automatically has $29 added to whatever the fee would have been for that visit. So it's kind of an interesting idea. Oh. You know, and 23 states now out of the 50 states have passed legislation in various, you know, various forms of that, you know, all for the goal of pushing the, the ACE information forward into general use. Mm. But Vincent, you say that childhood trauma could lead to serious somatic diseases. Oh, with overwhelmingly, yes. That's controversial in itself. And maybe even you can say that uh, uh, by... Uh, uh, treating the trauma, you can keep uh, these diseases at bay. That's even more controversial. But what about after you are diagnosed with cancer or autoimmune disease? Do you think it's possible that treating trauma could actually be beneficial on a somatic level to treat cancer? I, I, I think I think without question it's possible. You know now. To demonstrate to what degree is another another point, but is it possible? Yes. The, the mechanism that would suddenly cross my mind is, well, what destroys cancer cells? Well, two things. One, your own immune system. And two, pharmaceutical agents. Mm. So is, if it's possible to stimulate your immune system by reducing toxic stress, you know, that conceivably could have a real role. But that could be spun in a very tabloid way by some uh, critical yeah. listener, like yeah. <laughs> uh, cancer can be treated by psychotherapy or questionnaires. We don't need chemotherapy. We can just ask Dr. Folletti about uh, talking about my childhood. I I'm not saying this, but I just... I well, it would, it would, it, it's a certainly a simple enough experiment, you know, intellectually to, to set up, to do it on a large scale and then follow those people over five or ten years. That will be the you know, that's a bigger job. See, see when, I, when I was at Kaiser and, and I retired after 50 years there, 
but when I was there, um, that was relatively easy to do in that setting because the population was remarkably stable. I mean, in San Diego, we had the the, the city has about a million and a half people, you know, citizens in the city. And of those 635,000 were Kaiser members. And that was a very stable population. And since everything was paid for, you didn't have to worry, you know, by insurance, you didn't have to worry, can this patient afford this test or whatever. So we could put into play, you know, tests, the same test for thousands of people and, you know, and, and get standardized information on huge populations that we would then follow over time. It was just a remarkable setting, you know, for getting stuff like that done. I'm going to go out on a limb here and uh, it may sound conspiratorial, but do you think it's some economical disin- disincentives to uh, take your research on board for the health community? Because, I mean, talk is free. Talk is cheap. Uh, it's free. But medicine, the pharma industry, that's a lot of money. If if your ideas are widespread, it's, many people are going to lose a lot of money. But many people are going to save a lot of money. Yeah, but they, but they think they're going to lose money if they if we if they change from antidepressants or uh, oxytocin uh, opioids. Like I don't I don't think there's any need for you know for you know reducing those. There are need for additional things to be put into ah, play. Okay, so you don't think the pharma industry is like incentivizing your research or like trying to not, stop not, it? Not that I can see. No. No, okay. It's more that it seems difficult to talk about these issues. At yeah. All. Yeah. And people, as I said to you earlier, that people are really angry when I talk about these things, about the body's soul connection, because we always, we want to think that we can manipulate the body. Kind of. Sure. So, yeah. so keep in mind, if you were to activate awareness in the in the city in the community about this you know such as by a newspaper questionnaire as i mentioned um that that would really change the tone of things now and, and another another thing that i that i have in mind and we're beginning to work on it what if one were to interview patients on the internet hmm. okay to show them what a really comprehensive, show the public what a really comprehensive medical history looks like. Mm. Now, you don't do that in practice face to face. It's too time consuming, hence expensive. It really is best done by an inert mechanism to get the information. You know, for us, 10 page questionnaire on the internet, fill it out goes through a scanner, picks up all the yes answers, gives us a nice two, three page laser printout, takes two or three minutes to read that. What you knew before even meeting the patient was extraordinary. You know, you knew where you had to go further, et cetera. So, so, you know, the, the, the cost savings, it, it made something that would ordinarily be unaffordably expensive to do verbally, you know, it would take an hour to go through the questions. Then you got to make a written record of what you've learned. And so, oh, God, uh, no, so so you know, it, it's it's doable, but but there is resistance, and the resistance is not from patients, not from manufacturers, but from physicians hmm. who simply don't know what to. The information don't want to embarrass themselves by you know opening up something, well, what do I do now? Well, what you do now is really easy. I yeah. see on the questionnaire that, can you tell me how that's affected you later in your life? And then you just sit and listen. Forget the humbug about, oh, that was awful, I'm so sorry. To no, no, absolutely not, no. You sit and listen, and that implicitly accepts the person. And that had a profound effect in a 135,000 patient sample out of my department, two and a half years throughput. It reduced doctor office visits by 35% the next year compared to their prior year and emergency room visits by 11%. But Vincent, uh, 
even not talking to you uh, changed my life because when I wrote about my body and how I kind of was struggling with my body, I've been twice as big as now. I've been half the size of what I am now. My body has always been kind of tortured in a way and, and food has been my kind of uh, the way of controlling feelings. And I read your research when I was working on my uh, last book and suddenly it dawned on me when everything started with food and that was uh, a rape that I experienced when I was 15 years old. That was the moment I started having a problem with food and I read your research and it was like, oh, okay, this isn't a coincidence. This is just what happens when you are uh, subjected to rape. It changes your relationship with food and other stuff. Yeah, and, uh, and, it, and then you discover the benefits of obesity. Yeah, and no, it it just it was difficult to say what happened, but it it just uh, it just happened. I I didn't even think anything consciously, but I just gained a lot of weight over. Uh, uh, yeah, some some years, but it all it all started at the year of fifteen, when I was raped. It wasn't a coincidence. It was very clear to me when I read your research, and it uh, it really released me. I uh, without even meeting you. So thank you for that. Really yeah, well, I mean, all sorts of things have benefits. I mean, I I used to smoke. Everybody in this country used to smoke, um, and when when I was a kid, I wanted to smoke because I wanted to look grown up. <laughs> I didn't see much future in being a kid, but I saw a lot of future in being grown up. Grown ups were where the power was. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. grown ups have failed, as Greta Thunberg is saying. <laughs> I'm asking a question. So, so I used to smoke to look grown up. And then I continued because of the benefits of nicotine. I mean, nicotine inhaled within 15 or 20 seconds has significant anti-anxiety activity, et cetera. You know, it's got real risks, but they're 15 or 20 years away. Mm. And my kids used to bother me about smoking, you know, because they heard in school it was bad for you. You kind of get spots on your lung, dad, and so on. And it was interesting. We were we were in Ireland on vacation once, and I don't remember what it was, but but my wife and the three kids were all ganged up on me, and so I said, "Let's go, let's go in for dinner to to break out of this." And so we sit down, and my one of my daughters takes the pack of cigarettes and passes them around. Nobody. None of them smoked or more did my wife. Everybody takes a cigarette. One daughter takes two cigarettes, sticks one up each nostril. The head waiter comes over with a match to light them. I thought, Jesus Christ. I mean, if they're going to humiliate me this way, <laughs> you know, a daughter with two cigarettes in her nose that are lit. Oh, God. <laughs> I just took the pack of cigarettes and crumbled them up and threw them away to get to get their torture tool away from them. <laughs> and then a couple of days later, I realized I hadn't smoked. Yeah, uh, it was that interesting. I wonder, I mean, you know, I didn't buy a replacement pack of cigarettes, and suddenly it occurred to me I wasn't going to be able to. And and I remember going home. We were at the airport in London. They had this marvelous Cuban exhibit of cigars, and I'm standing in front of it. Lewin's spell was terrific. And I realized I'm not going to be able to do that. Not that I didn't want to. I'm not going to be able to. You know, it was just sort of somehow built in. Um, and I thought, isn't that interesting? And... Um, I, I never, well, I, I did try to smoke again uh, once and um, couldn't do it. You know, it just, it was the pleasing part of it was somehow mysteriously gone. I mean, this unconscious process that my one daughter, you know, had, had to set off by sticking one cigarette up each nostril. <laughs> and, and making the process look ridiculous instead of grown up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We changed it somehow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Really interesting. Well, a lot of stuff goes on 
in one's unconscious. <laughs> It's important to talk about uh, trauma and sexual abuse, but uh, I'm a bit wary about uh, these questions seems to be in these days a bit politicized. Maybe you don't want to go down that road, but uh, it seems to me like now some people are saying if you talk about sexual abuse on a large scale in a society or something, it's kind of a left right wing issue. It's all these conspiracy theories. Uh, the, way, the way to avoid that is to take it out of the hands of individuals who have access to you know, social media and do it for a whole city. And do it yeah. on a large There's scale, a statistical level. Yeah. When you have a statistical material, you cannot politicize it. Yeah. You see it being politicized now in America with the, all these crazy theories about people, pedophiles going around and, uh, and the people are spreading these theories. I mean, the, 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 some well, of the core well, theories of the people who stormed the Congress was about they thought there were pedophiles inside there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's not damaging to the to 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 the to us being able to talk about trauma on a, on a serious not, level. Not, not if you have a lot of support in the community by presenting the by having the community present the information. Mm. Okay. You know, you have five thousand people send their anonymous questionnaires back to the newspaper. Wow, did you see what's in the paper today? You won't believe it, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, It's difficult you know, to make a conspiracy theory out the of that. The other thing is, what if one were, and I'm, and I'm working with a, with a psychiatrist on this, um, what if one were to develop a television program where patients were mean, meaningfully interviewed? Mm. Could you do it? Yeah. Could you get patients to do it without question? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I had a cousin growing up who was a television uh, director of, of some note. And uh, uh, he came to visit me after I was in practice here. And uh, um, I had questions. How the hell am I going to disseminate information meaningfully to patients? And he said, well, why don't we make a video? You play it at the very beginning of patient visit. So we did that and it worked superbly. So every patient coming into my department, and that was you know several hundred patients a day, step one after they checked in was to go into a video room and watch a, I think it was a 13 minute video that explained what we were going to do, why we were going to do it, mm -hmm. et cetera, how they needed to participate. So for instance, pulmonary function testing, you know, well, how do you do that? Well, you don't blow gently into the tube, you, you know, then we had a nicely dressed woman, you know, <sighs> illustrate, you know, you really do this with tremendous force, et cetera. So that worked really well. And then gradually, um, uh, one of my secretaries decided to go to night school to help me by learning how to do video editing. And we started interviewing patients. And uh, this was initially mainly from the obesity program, but then it spread to other things. And I would tell the patient, look, you know stuff that doctors need to know. Would you be willing to talk with me on videotape about this? It's not going to be on broadcast television, but I'll want to use pieces of it in medical school teaching and so forth. And I was never turned down. And the closing remark from patients was almost always, yeah. Yeah, if you think that would help somebody, doctor, I'll do that. And so I have this rather remarkable library of patient interviews speaking openly about otherwise unspeakable things. And the question that we're working on now, could we could we develop this into a meaningful TV program? I, I yeah. believe so. I believe it would attract enormous audiences. Yes, of course it would. Yeah, I would love to watch that. Yeah. Everyone that is affected will want to watch that because yeah. Yeah. that is the meaningful thing. <laughs> that yeah. is the one thing that you feel like you're walking around in a lie most of the time, that people are pretending that this doesn't exist. <laughs> and yeah. It's such a relief then when you understand yeah. that you're not alone, <laughs> that you're not alone. Yeah. Mm. Well, one question about uh, addiction, because you talk, uh, and that's 
quite okay to, to, to talk about obesity because it's a main subject. But as an addict myself, and I'm going to debate it now on, on the uh, National Library with uh, some researchers that are conservative and want to push back on drug reform and stuff like that. Uh, it's obvious from your research, I think I remember number 5,000% um, bigger chance of getting uh, serious addiction if you're prone if you've been subjected to uh, adverse childhood experiences. What are your thoughts about uh, decriminalization, drug reform, a more humane treatment of addicts? Oh, I, I, think, I think that's exceedingly important. I mean, you know, does it mean anything that the most commonly sold street drug is a recognized effective prescription antidepressant, one of the very first successful ones introduced in the country? Does that mean anything? Yeah, and you know, it's, it's it's pain relief, <laughs> quite literally. Mm. Yeah, sure. You know, and the same thing with whiskey, same thing with, you know, heroin, et cetera. So just to be clear, you support decriminalization and, and qu stop uh, criminalizing drug addicts? Well, I don't know that I would... You know that that's a complex issue, and 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 uh, but one one thing that I'm impressed with in Sweden, in uh, Sweden, in uh, Switzerland, um, th there was some city I visited, and they had an interesting clinic there. Can't remember the name of it. Zurich, in the yeah, the clinic, but, the Hebron clinic in Zurich. It was it was a clinic for drug addicts. Yeah who instead of buying their drugs on the street and buying, you know, contaminated material of unknown strength and so forth, they would come into the clinic and be given a, a, a dose of clean that they could inject themselves under observation, et cetera. And I thought, wow, I mean, this is really a, you know, very unconventional approach, but it was an interesting idea. Uh, and it came into being because the city was concerned that their um, revenue from tourism was being decreased because they had so many addicts who were lying unconscious in a city park and so forth that you know people didn't like to you know tourists didn't like to see that. So they came up with this idea, which seemed to have worked very well. And uh, I just saw the other day on the internet that there's some city in the United States that's beginning this program now. Um, I think it's a right idea to experiment with, you know, with alternate approaches to these things. Yeah, and we know from research that in uh, American prisons, it's a huge uh, part of them are uh, having mental issues, addiction uh, issues, uh, trauma issues. These people yeah. should maybe not sit in jail, but be treated or... At least for well, more so certainly the idea of having college education in prison. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that gives you a new opportunity for life when you get out. So it, it's, it's a step in the right direction. Um, and I, I'm, I'm in contact with a prisoner in California up north uh, who's been running an A study in, uh, in, in his prison. Um, the World Health Organization, you should know, um, for some years now, <clears throat> has been um, annually collecting ACE information from, I believe, it's 22 European nations and eight Asian nations, including China. Oh. So if you, if you look up World Health Organization hyphen adverse childhood experiences study on the internet, you'll quickly find the details. But okay. Vincent, does it make you very proud to have made this impact? <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm, 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 I'm certainly pleased, no question about it, but I'm also frustrated that it's catching on in all sorts of places other than medicine. You know, after 20 years of resistance, it's barely beginning in medicine. Well, when, when we published our first paper uh, um, in... 1997, something like that. It was turned down by all of the major medical journals in the world. Journal of the American Medical Association turned it down. 
Lancet turned it down. British Medical Journal turned it down. New England Journal of Medicine turned it down. We finally got accepted by the American Journal of Preventive Medicine, a, a very good journal, but you know, relatively obscure journal. And they gave us two editorials. And uh, wow, um, that has just exploded. And I read the other day that the ACE study, uh, you know, various publications, we, we have, I think, 152 publications from our work in the A study, and there are just thousands from other people's work, that the original A study has been cited now, I believe it was in, in over 300,000 different articles around the world, <laughs> you know, including from countries. You know, I get correspondence from people. I'm not even sure what the hell continent their country is in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to nominate you for the Nobel Prize, but I don't know which uh, category. Oh, we do that, yeah. <laughs> so, so, um, um, but, you know, so initially I was invited all over the United States and Canada by county and provincial school boards. School boards? Wow, what a surprise. Next, by police departments all over the country. Yeah, that was weird. <laughs> Next, by judicial systems all over the country. Next, by state legislatures. I remember in 1908 in Vermont. Vermont is a small state up in the Northeast. And um, the uh, one of the legislators in Vermont in everyday life was a gynecologist, an obstetrician gynecologist, and he was familiar with the A study. And he convinced the legislature that they should invite me to come and tell them about this. And so I did. And uh, two weeks later, uh, in addition to sending me a nice check for you know coming there, um, they write to me that uh, they have passed legislation designed to support the use in everyday practice. And I thought, well, that's terrific. But I mean, how does the state legislature going to do that? And, you know, so 22 more states did. The, the, the clearest method was in California, at least that I know of. There, may, there are lots of other methods that I don't know of around the country. But in California, as I mentioned, um, you know, $135 million, A, to disseminate the information to the general public, and then B, that any physician seeing a medical patient getting ACE information and recording it, $29 added to whatever the fee would have been for that visit. Mm. So, you know, it's been interesting to see. But the last people to, to go into this is the medical society. Yes. yes. Kaiser Permanente, you know, where I spent 50 years um, and in senior positions, Kaiser Permanente, after 20 years of, you know, resistance, uh, uh, following our first publication, is just beginning to introduce it into a couple of departments around the country. Hmm. You talked and, about and, and basically it's due to physician resistance. You talked about possible solutions. Uh, are you familiar with the familiar with the uh, trials uh, and the success of the use of, uh, for instance, ketamine in uh, psychotherapy and other? Uh, I, I, I've heard it, but uh, but but I. I have no meaningful knowledge of it. I will send you some uh, interesting links. We have an uh, American here in Norway. Do you know uh, Lowen Stewart uh, Hilde? Yeah. He's, uh, yeah. He's treating patients with ketamine and now soon with uh, MDMA and uh, psy psy psilocybin. Uh -huh. uh, and he has okay. amazing results on uh, uh, people with trauma, uh, treating uh, severe depression, suicidality, and uh, other very uh, uh, serious issues. So it's, it's many people that seems we should talk together. As yeah. you mentioned, it's uh, difficult to get the different fields to get to to link up and and uh, uh, align their ideas and maybe come up with new solutions. Uh, he'll ask. Okay. Uh, you, you might you might try contacting Anna Louise Kirkingen because she. Yeah, I will. I will. I'm even more ambitious. Yeah. I'm even more ambitious. Uh, do you do you think you're still able to 
to travel abroad or? Well, you know, my, my wife would be opposed to it now, you know, with the state of things. But otherwise, yeah, I'd certainly be willing to travel anywhere, yeah. It would be amazing to get you to Norway, worst case, on video link in a seminar with uh, Trina oh, well, that, and uh, Anna Louise. Don't you yeah. think that? Mm. Yeah, that, sure. That would be very easy, sure. That would be wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I've gotten to see parts of the world that I never would have. I mean, I've been to Iceland four times. I mean, you know, <laughs> wow, that was an interesting place to see. Um, you have so much of, uh, important to contribute still. You're still young. You can change the world. Yeah, I mean, you know, at, at 85, I feel like I'm in my 60s. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful to hear. <laughs> we need you here, Vincent. Hilda asked, uh, I have one last question. I get Hilda the last word. Uh, if you don't want it. <laughs> no, yeah. Uh, well, uh, I have to say something meaningful then. <laughs> uh, uh, Hilda talk, asked, am I doomed uh, because of my uh, history? Uh, and she also said that psychology and medicine should talk together. I would also say that philosophy should talk together with the psychology and medicine. I just recently interviewed the American philosopher in Australia called Greg Caruso. He and his colleague Neil Levy from South Africa. Um, they're uh, very prominent moral philosophers in the field of uh, human agency, the free will debate, determinism. Uh, the debate has been uh, aloof for hundreds of years. It's like, uh, is everything determined? Is it cause effect? But uh, they have uh, introduced a new term uh, called hard luck. Uh, and they say that doesn't matter if it's, if it's uh, quantum physics or if it's determined or whatever, because you don't choose your parents, you don't choose your uh, who is going to rape you or uh, sexually assault you. You don't choose to be born into a civil war with uh, rape, sexual abuse, uh, torture. Uh, are people doomed? Can we have human agency when people seem to not be able to choose if they're rich or poor, if they're assault, uh, abused or not? Yeah, I, I, th I think the the main response for a yes answer is, are people doomed? Not necessarily, particularly if they are supplied with understanding and emotional support. Mm. Not simply kindness, but understanding of what the issues are and support in spite of them. Mm. I mean, that was the key thing that we discovered in the WAIT program. Yeah. You know, and then and then in that 135,000 patient sample, well, people said to me, you know, how'd you do that? 35% reduction in doctor visits and 11 in ER. How'd you do that? You send everyone to therapy, right? No. Well, how'd you do that? We spent the number of weeks thinking about how the hell did we do that? And then I came to realize that we had created a lay analog of confession in the Catholic Church. And I'm not saying that as a religious person, because I'm not, but confession has been in use for 1,800 years, you know, suggesting, hmm, you know, maybe if it lasted that long, maybe it meets some basic human need mm. to be able to meet with somebody important to you, in that case, a priest, and ours, a doctor or a nurse practitioner, and share with them your sins or the dark secrets of your life, and minutes later realize you're still accepted, we're still part of the system, etc. And I believe that's that's what we unwittingly did. To be understood, to be understood. It's useful to keep in mind that in all of medicine, there are only three sources of diagnostic information: patient history, physical examination, and laboratory studies. Hmm. If you ask patients, and I have done this at 10,000 by questionnaire some years ago, patients assume at the 95 plus percent level, or at the 95 percent level, if that diagnosis comes out of lab tests. Oh, I want all the blood tests. Yeah, right. You don't have enough blood in your body for all of the blood <laughs> tests. 
If you ask experienced physicians, they'll tell you that about 75% of the time diagnosis comes out of patient history. Hmm. It may be confirmed by physical findings or laboratory studies, but out of patient history. Hmm. Problem with that is that when you deal with complex subjects, like a human being, it's important not to respond only to the manifest symptom of the moment. Okay? But to get a detailed history of all parts of that system. Hmm. Well, that's too time consuming. It's unaffordable. That's why you use an, an inert mechanism like a questionnaire to, to get all of that. Patient spends an hour at home filling that out. Hmm. A good analog is house fires. In a house fire, the manifest symptom is the smoke billowing out. You know, hey, I mean, people die of smoke inhalation. Well, we better bring big fans to treat those house fires and blow, blow that dangerous smoke away. Except the house burns down faster now. <laughs> Fortunately, fire departments understand that you don't respond to the manifest symptom. You respond to the underlying cause, which is typically invisible inside. And you use fire hoses, not big fans. So there's, there's a real analogy to medical practice. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to respond to the manifest symptom? Terrific. You treat tuberculosis with cough medicine and aspirin for the fever. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's why your research made me so mad because we're just talking about the wrong things the whole time well be sure to look up adverse childhood experiences on the internet and and on youtube i mean there are many video presentations that i've done you know, that are there that can be seen. But if you just look up adverse childhood experiences, you'll be able to find any kind of detail that you're interested in because there are literally thousands of citations. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. The, the thing is, why aren't we talking more about this? And in Norway, totally unknown. I'm traveling around talking about your research and no one has ever heard about it. No, it, I mean, it really needs to be integrated into medical schools here, I teach at the medical school at the University of California, and um, I, I lecture on the A study every year, and, and the students are exceedingly receptive of it. Mm. Uh, you know, really, really interesting, exceedingly receptive of it. Yeah, I think the times are changing. That is why I asked you about Kirking and why it happened at the same time. I think it's something in the time changing. We are changing well, perception of the body. Many, many people have made the point to me that, you know, change is very slow. Mm. It, took, it took decades for the infectious disease concept to be accepted. Mm. It took decades for anesthesia to be mm. accepted. Yes. And I remember reading a line in a book somewhere, the reason change is so difficult is that accepting change means accepting that we've been doing it wrong all along. Yeah. Interesting concept. Yeah, it's it's like walking to the South Pole and suddenly realizing you were walking towards the wrong pole, right? So you don't want to turn around. Yeah. It feels yeah. bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I think that time will change and I will do my part in changing the times <laughs> following your mm -hmm. research. It's important to talk about uh, these issues, but uh, it's maybe very difficult to talk about uh, the ones who are committing these acts of abuse. Uh, do, you, do you have any idea or notion about how we can prevent people? No, I, th I think the idea there, you know, would, would best and most easily be done in prisons. Have prisoners anonymously fill out the ACE questionnaire, bring them together in an auditorium, put the pooled anonymous data up on the screen. What do you guys think this means? But how would that help prevent people from uh, committing abuse? I didn't understand that. Well, no. it would help people by beginning to understand the causes of it and, and understand it in the, in the statements of the causal agents, the, the prisoners. <clears throat> so I what can we do differently? I'm, I'm you know? writing about this in my book about Sofia Freib um, Freiburg. 
Sophia Prabhu, uh, Ghost in the Nursery. You know that book? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I she's... have it on her shelf somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yes, of who's, course. Who's the author? Uh, isn't it? Sof uh, isn't she called Sophia Prabhu? Uh, I'm just, uh, I, I'm not, it's not in front of me. Sophia Freiburg, I think. And she's uh, doing this experiment also with, uh, isn't it with a young woman that she's helping to overcome these ghosts? The ghost of her past, her and the neglect in her past. And the experiment really shows how knowledge changes you and uh, and breaks this uh, cycle of uh, abuse that uh, we usually do and uh, reading about that just made me very hopeful since I've been reading so much about this and and fighting my own <laughs> abusive history I've I I kind of feel like and I can I, I can say this safely that my child is safe and that I'm able to treat her well and that I have broken the cycle that is generations of abuse in my past. It is possible to break that cycle, I believe, with knowledge. Oh, yeah. No, no question about that. And, you know, in, in my mind, the way of reaching, you know, tens of millions of people would be with the television show, not to teach people but to depict what it looks like, mm. okay? You know, yeah. like I saw Dr. Brazelton on the TV thing depicting what it's like to look in the eyes of a newborn. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Had I not seen it, I probably wouldn't have tried it myself a week or two later. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. Hmm. Well, I think it was a good talk. <laughs> I feel like it's been so many impressions I have to digest now. But it was such a pleasure talking to you. I hope we talk again, Vincent. It was Absolutely. A, sure. It was a huge pleasure for me to talk sure. to you. I have to kiss my daughter goodnight now. <laughs> okay. I always happy to see you. I'm very pleased you came. And I hope we can arrange something Hopefully you can fly to Norway, but if not, we can arrange it on video and make a seminar, sure. mini sure. seminar about these very important topics that range yeah. from obesity to addiction and touches everything. So yeah. you're still hip and cool and relevant. <laughs> and we will uh, use, use our platforms to share your ideas. Uh, we speak soon. Be well. Thank you. Enjoy Keep winter. Touch. <laughs> and Hilda will probably uh, want to send her books to you. I think we can arrange that. Have you well. had snow yet there? No, not yet. Not it's yet, coming. No? Yeah. It's coming. Always. <laughs> Winter is coming. Thank you. Pleasure, pleasure being with you. Yes. I, know. I have to run myself. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye.